put some pictures on the screen, maybe you could identify with some of this as you think about your marriage or perhaps a relationship you're in. Is your marriage like this? Or maybe you would identify more with this picture. Ah, yes. Maybe, maybe it feels a little bit like this. Closed in, or perhaps it's a little bit more like this. Wide open. Maybe it feels a little bit like this in this season. Or perhaps you are the envy of all couples because you your marriage looks like this right there. What a cool picture that is. What picture is your marriage depicting? Well, over the past several weeks, the Apostle Paul has been talking about marriage in his letter to the Ephesians, and he has had a very specific picture in mind as he has been describing marriage. And I want to read this passage that we've been looking at from different angles over the past several weeks, and it comes from the New Testament book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 32. These words are going to be on the screen if you want to read along with them quietly. I'll do the reading out loud. I want you to you know, be that guy that awkwardly starts reading with me whenever I say, read with me. You can read those or you can just close your eyes and just try to picture what it is that Paul's talking about. Ephesians 5, verse 22 through 32. The Apostle Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're all members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The word of the Lord. Paul's making an incredible connection here. Maybe you picked up on it. The picture that he has in his mind when he thinks about marriage is a picture of the gospel. And when I say the gospel, I mean the good news about Jesus Christ. Paul is picturing a marriage when he thinks about the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the marriage between Jesus and his bride, which is the church And the church is made up of of all those who have placed their faith in Jesus, who have who have sin and that sin over to him. On the cross. That's the church, and the Bible describes the church as a beautiful bride. To Paul and all the writers of Scripture, all throughout the pages of your Bible, if you begin to look for it, you'll see this metaphor. It's a marriage. It's an intimate, covenant relationship. And to better understand this picture that Paul's got in mind, we need to look at one verse in particular, some instruction given to us husbands. Ephesians 5, verse 25 Paul said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. So guys, we can tune in right here because we're, you know, if we're thinking, you know, how do you love a woman? 
Well, it's probably not going to be found in a Nicholas Sparks movie, thankfully. Might not be found on a blog post on the internet. Might not be found in the lyrics to an R&B song, although all of those things might be helpful in certain ways. We need to start with this question. How does Jesus love the church? How does Jesus love his bride? I want to give you three ways this morning. And the first is this. Jesus pursues his bride. Jesus pursues his bride, and it's been like this since the very beginning. The, the apostle John in his gospel uh, writes this at the very beginning. John 1, verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the word. And he's talking about Jesus. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And then he says this about Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus was right there in the beginning. He was there in the garden with Adam and Eve when they first disobeyed God and sin entered into the world. Jesus was right there in this scene in Jesus, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, when Adam and Eve had disobeyed God and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, when they heard God coming, the man and his wife, they hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. They hid themselves among the trees of the garden. But the Lord, God, called to them, pursued them. And he said, where are you? Adam, where are you? Not because he didn't know. You know, I mean, Adam and Eve had, you know, sort of sewn some fig leaves together, just, you know, hiding behind trees that were probably not big enough to really hide themselves, kind of like your kids do when they play hide-and-go-seek when they're toddlers, and they, you know, they think if they cover their eyes, they can't see you, and you can't see them. God is pursuing Adam and Eve. When sin entered into the world, we started running, and God started pursuing. And it ultimately led to Jesus coming to earth and putting on flesh and moving into the neighborhood, as John would later, later say. And he became one of us on his pursuit of us. And this is how Jesus described his mission in Luke 19.10. He said, the son of man, he's referring to himself, came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. To seek and to save the lost. And there are a lot of us, maybe like I was at one time, who see the word seek there and then just think destroy after that. Like Jesus came on a seek and destroy mission. He's come to find us out. We've broken the law. You know, we've sinned against God. And now he's seeking us out to destroy us. I've never been much of a video gamer. But uh, when I was in sixth grade, we got the original NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. It was awesome. Mario Brothers, Duck Hunt. Anybody remember a little bit of little Duck Hunt? Like that game was awesome. Uh, well, a few years after we got the, the NES, because we were not, you know, first adopters by any stretch, but uh, it seemed like it was just a year or two later that the Super NES came out. And, of course, my next-door neighbor, my best friend, Alan, got the Super NES, and he got this game called Super Mario Kart. You guys ever play Mario Kart? My kids have this now on the Wii. And it's awesome because you got this little steering wheel. And in case you, you know, don't know much about Mario Kart, you know, you're basically, you know, Mario or Luigi, or, you know, one of these characters. And uh, I got a picture of that, I think. Um, you know, they're racing around the track. Everybody's, you know, chasing after you. And you're given these tools, like, to try to, like, give everybody the slip behind you. You know, you got these banana peels you can throw out onto the track, you know, and make people spin out. You've got uh, these, like, turtle shells that you can throw, and they spin around, and they make everybody wreck, trying to throw everybody off your trail. And in my life, I've thrown a lot of banana peels and a lot of turtle shells to try to give Jesus the slip, to try to give maybe people that were pursuing me, wanting to, to love me and, and, and show me Jesus, maybe Jesus himself trying to pursue me and show me his love. I've been trying to give him the slip and trying to run away because I misunderstood his message. I thought he was coming to destroy. 
I thought he wanted to judge me and shame me and condemn me. Or maybe turn me into some religious nut. And so I ran from him. I missed the seek and the save part. But Jesus himself very clearly stated in John 3, 17, right after that you know, most famous verse, John 3, 16, Jesus said this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus is not on a seek and destroy mission. He's on a seek and save mission. And he's always been pursuing us. Just like he pursued Matthew, the tax collector, that just blew everyone away. Just like Jesus pursued the woman who was caught in adultery. Just like Jesus pursued Zacchaeus the crook or the Samaritan woman at the well. Just like Jesus pursued John who was running from him, had given him and his church the bird. Jesus has always been pursuing, leaving the 99, going after the one, chasing people who don't deserve it who are running, hiding, even fighting back, and he just keeps coming, and he keeps coming, and he keeps coming. Banana peel, turtle shell, raise my fist at him, he keeps coming. Deny him, he keeps coming. Push him away, he keeps coming. It's relentless. As the song says, it's reckless. Not in a, not in an irresponsible kind of way, but in a, in a mind-blowing kind of way. Jesus is pursuing you. As Chris mentioned it a minute ago, every soul is in this room because God is pursuing you. And you're here for a reason. And Paul says, husbands, you're to love your wife like this. To chase her. To pursue her. Even if she's running even if she's fighting back, even if she's stonewalling or she's hurting or she's hiding. Look at Jesus and how he pursues his bride. And then when he finds her, Jesus serves his bride. Scripture is pretty clear about leadership in marriage. In marriage, Paul says in verse 23 of Ephesians 5, the husband's the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. A lot of people bristle at that. Oh, like we're talking about headship and authority. Is that, I mean, the husband is above the wife and he can kind of lord it over her. Well, actually, no. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. We have to look at how Jesus used his authority and how he walks out this authority. And Jesus is really clear again. He says in Mark 10, 45, he says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this has implications for us. That Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. In fact, he would go on and spell it out for his disciples. In fact, multiple times he had to try to teach them this lesson. And we see one scene of it in the Gospel of Luke 22, verse 25. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, The kings of the Gentiles, the leaders, they exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so. These guys were all about positions of authority. They were wanting to, they were lining themselves up to try to get on Jesus' right or his left, you know, when he sits on his throne in his kingdom and they overthrow the, the Roman occupation. And, you know, like they're gonna, they're gonna have these great positions of leadership and authority. And Jesus says, it's not like that. Rather, let the greatest among you become like the youngest and the leader as one who, what? The leader as one who serves. For who's the greater? One who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? That's what we would think. But I among you, I am among you as one who serves. Jesus would later model this for the guys at that last supper, that last night before Jesus you know, gets arrested and eventually 
you know, take him to the cross to die. He's having dinner with his boys. And he gets up from the table, takes a towel from around his waist, and he takes a basin. And the guys are like, what, what is going on? What is the Lord doing? He gets down on his knees, and he picks up their dirty feet, and he begins to wash them. He begins to wash all that dirt and mud and scat off of these grown men's smelly feet. And Peter's like, what are you doing, Jesus? Do you remember this scene in the Gospel of John? And Jesus is like, I'm showing you something. What I've done for you, I want you to do for others. That's what it looks like to be a leader. That's what Paul's got in mind when he says, husbands, you're the head. You're going to lead, but you're going to lead like Jesus. You're going to serve like Jesus serves his bride. And Jesus takes all of his power, all of his authority, and he leverages it for what is best for his bride. That's what it looks like to lead like Jesus. You know, one of the real specific ways that Jesus serves his bride is by giving her a new identity. And we can see this just in our own marriages. I remember, you know, as, as Catherine Francis Coffin was preparing to marry John Austin Teague, she had to go to the courthouse and start, you know, doing all that stuff to, to get her name changed. Because the day that we stood before God and our family and friends, and the pastor said, John, you may kiss the bride. He then said, may I introduce to you for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. John Teague. And Katie was no longer Catherine Francis Coffin. She was Catherine Coffin Teague. She had taken on my name. And I took on her debt for that Volkswagen. We paid it off. Katie took on a new name. And you know, Jesus does this in, in an even more incredible way in giving us a totally new identity. He basically takes on all, he takes on all of our, our, our record, you know, like all our guilt and our shame and our sin. And he takes that old record and he expunges it. It's washed clean. Paul said it like this in Colossians 2. He said, having forgiven us all our trespasses, Jesus canceled the record of debt that stood against us. With all its legal demands, what that means in a spiritual sense is that we deserve death and eternal condemnation, but Jesus nailed that to the cross. He canceled your record of debt. He took it on himself, and he gave you a new name, child of God. He gave you a new identity. You became a new creation. You know, I said this last week, but I think it's worth saying again. You know, if we have too small a view of that record of debt, if we have too small a view of our sin, God's grace will be too small. But if we really understand just how deep our sin really is, how ugly it is, how bad it was that it would send Jesus all the way to a a bloody death on a cross, then all of a sudden we would see God's grace in all its beauty and its glory. And the fact that Jesus would cancel that debt and give us a new identity would be the greatest thing that any could, anyone could ever, would ever do for us. Jesus serves his bride by taking all his power and authority and leveraging it for what is best for her. And Paul says that ultimately that meant he had to give himself up for her. He pursues her, he serves her, and he dies for her. Jesus dies for his bride. Peter, who followed Jesus, who denied Jesus, who experienced the pursuit of Jesus, said this in 1 Peter 2. He said, Jesus committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled or when he was insulted, and Peter would have heard this and seen this because he was at a distance that night as Jesus was being accused and beaten. 
Jesus did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. In the midst of all that trial and struggle, Jesus continued to trust God. How might we apply that to our own lives? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus went all the way to the very end. He humbled himself to a death on the cross, dying for his bride. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like this, but, but for a second, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to picture a wedding. Right now, picture a wedding. And I want you to, to see the bride's not there yet. The processional has happened. The, uh, the, the, the groom and his groomsmen and the, the pastor, they're all up front. What color is the groom wearing? I know that it's 2019 and like all the rules are off and, and people are getting married and all kinds of stuff now. And if you were married in the 70s, you might've had a powder blue tux. But traditionally speaking, as you picture a groom, what color is he wearing? He's wearing black. And not just because it's a, it's a formal event, not just because he wants to look nice and spiffy, although those things are all true. But from the very beginning, as we think about this picture of a wedding and a marriage being a picture of the gospel, the groom is wearing black because he's representing Jesus. It's the color of, of, of death because the groom's dying to himself. He's dying to himself as he begins to covenant with his bride. And when we picture those doors opening up and the music changing and the, the bride appearing, what color is she wearing? She's wearing white. And not because she's innocent or pure at this wedding, although people have made those traditions along the way, but because she's She's imaging, she's representing the church that is now being presented to Jesus, as Paul would say there in Ephesians, spotless and pure. See, he's taken on all the sins of the church when he died for her, and now she's radiant in all her glory. That's what's being revealed all throughout the scriptures, this marriage between Jesus and the church. In the ancient Jewish concept of a wedding, there were three parts. You can open your eyes now, by the way. First, there was a marriage contract that would be signed by the parents of the bride and the groom. And the parents of the, the groom, or maybe even the groom himself, would pay a dowry to the bride or her parents, which I am all in for, because I have three daughters. Let's bring back the dowry. Right, amen? Yes, let's do that. But that's what began the betrothal period. That's what we would call the engagement. That's the period that Joseph and Mary were in when she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. There was this betrothal period. Then the second step in the process usually occurred about a year later when the, the groom, accompanied by all his, his boys, they would go to the bride's house at midnight, sort of creating this torchlight parade through the streets of the town. And then they would they would take the bride and, and her maidens and they would all go back to the bridegroom's home, to the, to the home of his parents. And then the third phase of the marriage would begin and it might last for days. It was this great marriage supper, this great feast, this party. We saw a scene of that in the Gospel of John, Jesus' first miracle. He was at a wedding. He turned the water into wine. It was this great feast, this great party. And it's all pointing to something bigger that's going on. The first two phases of this wedding process have already taken place. On earth, as each of us place our faith in Jesus Christ, 
as our Savior, you know, the dowry's been paid for us. The groom paid for it himself in his own blood. And therefore, we become the bride of Christ, the church on earth today. It's like we are betrothed, so to speak. The second phase will begin when Jesus returns. He takes us back to his father's house that he's prepared for us, the church. And then there's going to be this final stage. The book of Revelation talks about it like this. He says, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. There's this marriage supper that's going to take place. The prophet Isaiah prophesied about it long ago in the Old Testament. It's going to be feasting and partying, and it's going to be the church all brought together from from all centuries, from every tribe, nation, and tongue will be gathered, and we will be celebrating that this marriage is finally complete. A perfect union for eternity. That's the story of salvation, and it's the picture of the gospel. And that is what Paul had in mind when he said this mystery is profound, and I'm talking about Jesus and the church. So what? What does this mean for us? Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did he do it? He pursued her, he served her sacrificially, and then he died for her. Guys, I got one more picture for you. I'm a big orange fan through and through, but I'm not a hater. And I can understand and recognize success when I see it. And one of the programs in college football that has experienced a lot of success over the past decade or so is the Alabama Crimson Tide. I know I have to admit it, as much as it pains me. A few years ago, there was a group of pastors who were invited to go visit the campus at the University of Alabama, and they were, they were given access to go tour the new training facility, which is 37,000 square feet of squat rack, dumbbell, blood, sweat, and tears. Throw a little protein powder and mix all that together and roar. And these, these pastors got to meet the strength and conditioning coach, Scott Cochran, who's been with Nick Saban for over a decade. He's got five national championships, you know, under his belt. And, and he comes up to greet these pastors, begins to talk to them, and he gives them a chance to ask some questions. And one of the pastors is like, uh, Coach Cochran, could you tell us the secret to the success of Alabama's program? And, and he just stops right there, and he's like, whoa! Because, you know, every strength and conditioning coach is like, doesn't have a voice. He's like, whoa, we are not successful. The first step in failure is thinking you've arrived at success. They're like, you know, (laughs) writing this down, writing this down. He goes on to talk about their program and this this fourth quarter program by by Coach Saban and all the ways they, they train and prepare these guys. And he says, this is what we want to do. This is what we want these young men to do. We want them to touch the line. What? He's talking about sprints. He's talking about gassers. If you've ever played a sport, you might know, like basketball, football, you, you know, the coach blows the whistle, you take off, run into a line, you bend down, you touch the line, you go back to where you start, you touch the line. Then you go a little bit further, you bend down, you touch the line, you go back to when you start, you touch the line. And the coach is saying, when you're tired, when you are worn out and you're hurting and no one's cheering you on, and maybe no one's even watching. You have a decision to make. Will you get all the way down and touch the line? As I think about how Jesus loves his bride, how we are called to love our brides, husbands, it's like touching the line. Pursue, serve, die. When we're tired from work and it's been a busy week, 
nobody's watching. Nobody's cheering you on. And you don't feel like it. Touch the one. Pursue. Serve. Die. When life's been hard and circumstances are confusing and you're not sure what God's doing or if he's even there and your spouse isn't making it any easier on you, touch the line. Pursue. Serve. Die. Pursue. Serve. Now, lest you think that what I'm saying, husbands especially, listen up, that you just need to grit your teeth and you just need to try harder and you just need to go out there and love your wife. (laughs) You need to know where the power comes from. The power comes from this right here, 1 John 4, 19. Memorize it. We love because... He first loved us. We can love our wives like this. Because we look to Jesus and we see just how much he's loved us. And to the extent that we reflect on that, we invite that into our lives and we begin to believe that and trust that we will be given the power to love like to pursue, serve.